Good evening. I'm Ed Murrow. The name of the program is Person to Person. And again tonight, we'll be following our live cameras on a couple of informal visits. We'll be going here in Midtown Manhattan in New York to visit two attractive and intelligent actresses, Jane and Audrey Meadows. And then we'll be going up to New Rochelle to visit Bob Smith, the man who created and is the best friend of Howdy Doody. We'll be ready in just 20 seconds. Long distance, Maine to Florida. The American Oil Company, the drillers who produce oil, the scientists who refine it, the seamen who transport it, the men who deliver it, and the Amoco dealers who serve you, all the Amoco people calling you person to person. Some years ago, two little American girls, the daughters of American missionaries in China, came home. Jane Meadows was then seven. Her sister Audrey was five. Things were not easy. They had to learn a new language. They had to learn the difference between an ice cream cone and a comb for the hair. They had to learn to point with their fingers rather than with their chins. They had to give up Chinese ways and learn American ways. While learning these details, these two girls also learned to act. And since they returned to this country, they have acted on Broadway, in movies, in nightclubs, have done, in fact, practically everything that can be done by skilled entertainers. When they're not working, they share a three and a half room apartment on East 57th Street. A number of people in show business live in this building, Georgia Gibbs, Artie Shaw, and others. It's just a short cab ride from the television studios, the photographer studios, and the rehearsal halls where Jane and Audrey Meadows do most of their work. It's here that the girls spend endless time telling each other what they did, saw, and heard since they last discussed such affairs of the day. Tonight, the girls are at home waiting for you. Evening, Jane. Hi. Hello, Audrey. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Morrow. What, what are you doing out there? Oh, we're looking for stars and waiting for you to come in and visit us. Well, what, what are you looking at exactly? We're looking at our skyline, off our terrace. C could we see a little bit of it? Yes. Can you see it? Can you hear the fire engines going by? Yes, so can I. That looks like the Chrysler building, is it? It yes. is, yes. And we can see the United Nations building, too. Uh -huh. The Empire State, it's a little cloudy to see that, actually. And then, is that the GE building, I think, right behind us? Mm-hmm. Yes. I, I quite can't quite see any stars, uh, but are you two interested in stars? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, we're interested in uh, Libra and my sister Aquarius. <laughs> well, what, what, what does that mean? I mean, what, what do you conclude from that? Well, uh, Libra means the month of September. That's when I was born, and Audrey was born in February, which is Aquarius. And we, we've discovered that uh, Librans and Aquarians are the perfect match. Why? Well, uh... Jane's sign is air, aren't you, yes, air? I'm air, and you're and air. I'm uh, water. And air and water mix very well. And if one of us were a fire sign and the other water, it'd be just murder, because water puts out a fire. That's true. Well, no. I, was, I was born in April. What does that make me, oh, if anything? Oh, you're Pisces. Oh, Pisces is a water sign, too. That's fish. Mm-hmm. Fish. You'd get along very well with us. Fish. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, you girls aren't superstitious, are you? Oh, no. No, no mm -hmm. we're not superstitious at all. Just little things like whistling in dressing rooms or putting shoes on dressing room tables and... Uh, well, we're not really superstitious about that because if that happens, all you have to do is spin around three times and then you sit down and you count to ten and you don't have to be superstitious because nothing's going to happen bad to you. That's the most encouraging thing I've heard in months. And you know something else? Broken mirrors are very good luck. Are they? Well, let's go inside and sit down and talk about it, shall we? All right. Please come on in. But has anybody told you that uh, we're redecorating our living room and all the furniture was moved out and the new furniture doesn't start arriving until Monday? The only thing we have that came in today is our curtains. But if you'll come in just as it is, we'd love to have you. Good, thank you. You like this couch we're about to sit on? So far, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> well, that's too bad because it's borrowed. Uh, we tell got me, it from uh, my neighbor across the hall. Uh-huh. He's sitting on the floor at this point. <laughs> As a matter of fact, everything in the apartment is borrowed just for tonight. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, do you girls put much faith in lucky numbers, handwriting analysis, and palm reading, and that sort of thing? Oh, yes, we do. As a matter of fact, when I first started in show business, I was doing comedy on Broadway. And one night I went to a party and a world famous handwriting expert was there and she read my writing and she said, oh, you are a great dramatic actress, aren't you? And I said, no. And she said, oh, my dear child, that's what you must do. And I started shortly after that and that's where I've had my greatest success. Do you have any lucky numbers or anything like that? Yes, seven and three. We have both in our address here and this has been a very lucky apartment for us. Well, now what's better about seven and three than about other numbers? Well, they're not five, six, or eight. <laughs> <laughs> well, does, does this uh, superstition or belief in numbers help you in your work? Yes, it really does. We have uh, certain days. Now, Friday is a very good day for us. Mm -hmm. well, that's why we're glad you came in tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know you're both television actresses and you're clock watchers. Mm -hmm. And I know something about uh, what you have done. Why don't you each take about 30 seconds and tell us your credits? Is that the right word, credits? Yes. Yes, but I don't think we could tell you anything in 30 seconds. Let's see. All right, Jane, you start. Like, uh, well, I started on Broadway, and I was in about six plays. The last play, I played opposite Richard Widmark, and that took me to Hollywood, and I was under contract to MGM for a year and a half. I made four pictures. The first was with Katherine Hepburn and Robert Taylor. Then I made a movie with Robert Montgomery, and I was in The Last of the Thin Man and The First of the Fat Man <laughs> series. And then I went to 20th Century Fox and I played opposite Tyrone Power in a movie and I made David and Bathsheba at 20th Century Fox. But the best part I ever had was in a Samuel Goldwyn picture called Enchantment. And I came back to New York and I started in television and I do a weekly show, you know, every Wednesday night yes. on the same channel with Gary Moore. It's called I've Got a Secret. Mm -hmm. And besides that, I've done most of the dramatic shows on television. Audrey, you did it in just 30 seconds, by the way. Did she oh. really? Audrey? <laughs> See if you can do it. All I can tell you in 30 seconds is I'm on your show tonight. <laughs> well, I didn't make any movies because Jane had a corner on that market, but I started out as a singer, a classical singer, and then when Jane was so successful on Broadway, she said, why don't you go into something lighter? So I spent a year or so just auditioning for every show on Broadway, and I couldn't get arrested. So I worked in nightclubs and anywhere where they'd hire me, and they used to bill me as the singing cover girl because they had to figure out some gimmick of explaining this crazy voice. <laughs> so then uh, I went overseas during the war in Mexican Hayride, and then I came back and visited Jane in California for a while because I was sick with malaria. And my biggest break in show business came when I got the lead in the Chicago company of High Button Shoes. And then I came back to New York and I went on television with Bob and Ray and then into the lead in Top Banana with Phil Silvers. And then I left Phil to go with Jackie Gleason. Well, so Audrey, I Audrey, I guess there are millions of people who know you as poor old Alice Cramden, the bus driver's wife on that Jackie Gleason show. <laughs> what what <laughs> sort of fellow is Gleason to work with? Oh, he is the greatest. He really is the world's greatest comedian. He's fantastic to work with. He's a sensational actor and he knows every facet of the business and does the entire show himself on Saturdays. And uh, his little trick, I think, of, of making the show come off so well with uh, the barest amount of rehearsal for all of us is that he keeps everybody laughing. And he breaks any form of tension that could start. And when there is no tension, you can do things very quickly. Well, Audrey, uh, uh, do you ever hear from bus drivers or their wives? Yes. I got a letter that was signed by five irate bus drivers' wives. And they wrote me, and they, I'm, most people think that I'm not Audrey Meadows. They think I'm Alice Cramden, and they think that I actually live in that kitchen, so they feel very sorry for me. And they wrote me a letter saying that they had watched for some time and seen that there were no curtains on the windows. And they said, now, we make the same salary as Ralph Cramden, and we all can afford to have curtains on our kitchen windows. And about a week later, I got a big package in the mail, and it was white curtains for the kitchen and the set. <laughs> Jane, uh, how do you like doing panel shows? Oh, I love them, Mr. Morrow. It's the most wonderful thing because... There's no work, you know, we have no rehearsals. I just get dressed all up in an evening gown, put on my earrings and go to the theater. It's just like going to a party. Are there any secrets about Gary Moore? I have no secrets about Gary Moore. As a matter of fact, I feel just the way 30 million of his fans do. He's the most wonderful man to work with. Well, let's get off business for a moment. Uh, where are we now in your apartment? Well, we're in the middle of nowhere. nowhere. <laughs> You're in the middle of an empty living room. And over here... It's going to be very pretty, though. We hope you'll come back sometime and see. Audrey, show Mr. Morrow where the well, mirror is going to be. This whole wall is going to be mirrored, and we're going to have a huge eight-foot couch. It's going to be absolutely sensational. Uh -huh. and, and then there's a piano that goes in this corner. This what, what, what's this down on the floor that I can see there? This? Yes. 
Well, this is a model of the church that my father built in <coughs> China. Uh, he had this church, St. Andrews, for 14 years. Mother and Daddy raised all the money. We had a church, and then our home was over here, and there was a large school and a clinic for the sick. It was a beautiful place. I hope, I think it's still standing. Could we see inside the model? Yes, mm, the top certainly. comes off. As a matter of fact, this was made to scale by the carpenters. Can you see the inside? Yes, I it, can. It seated 750 people. This was made by the carpenters who made the original building as a present for mother and daddy. Uh -huh. And uh, they well, wanted to show it at the World's Fair. It's the first, uh, the, uh, Daddy's buildings were the first ever built in China in their own native architecture because Daddy felt it was easier for them to worship in a building that was comfortable for them and familiar to them. The only thing where, where's your father now? Daddy has a parish in Sharon, Connecticut. And as a matter of fact, he's sitting in the rectory right now with most of the parish watching this show. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, uh, do you two speak Chinese? Well, we spoke it when we came to this country fluently, but we have very little opportunity to keep it up. We don't speak it very well now. No, just a few words. <laughs> well, can you sing it? Yes, yes, we can sing a few songs in it. All right, let's hear one. All right. Would you like to? <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. want to? Go ahead. Yes, and I will wash out the sem mim gauze sem mim bur fan shao hai zhe zhe mun yan sui wo jian feng zhe fu zhen zhe ye so nai wo zhe ye so nai wo all right, you keep learning things on this program. What does it all mean? Didn't you understand the lyrics? <laughs> <laughs> it means, Jesus loves me, this I know. Tell me, you two girls live together and seem to get along so well. What's the secret for sisters getting along as well as you two? We love each other. We never really thought of it until we got into show business and people began to ask us this question over and over again. I think, Mr. Morrow, it probably is that we don't feel there's any competition between the two of us. We've always been each other's best friend because we move so much and we're always very close. My two brothers are very close. We have a brother, Frank, and Ed Carter, which is our real name. And the whole family is close. Audrey, you're the athletic Meadows girl, I believe. Yes. Have you ever won anything in sports competition? Uh, well, you mean trophies or cups? Yes. No, but I have something I'd like to show you in the other room. Good. Jane, do you think Audrey is funny? Oh. Audrey has been making me laugh, Mr. Morrow, since we were babies. Yes, I think she's very funny. Let's go in and see what she's doing now, can we? All right, I'd love to. What are you up to, Audrey? Well, I, I'm trying to get out a single water ski, but it's easier to ski than it is to get it out from under Jane's bed. <laughs> Yes, I can't get out. <laughs> we have lots of things hidden under there. Oh, well, it's only a single one. Yes, you see, you start out on two, and then when you get your balance set, you drop one ski off, and you keep whichever foot's easiest in this main binding, and then the back foot is just slipped in here for balance. Oh, yeah. Well, and Jane, don't you have any trophies? Uh, I don't have any trophies, Mr. Morrow, but I, I collect earrings. Or if you hand me that box there. And as a matter of fact, I have probably about a thousand pan now. I started out with 500, but the fans keep sending them to them all the time. And these are part of a hundred pair that one boy alone made for me by hand. Then I have, give me the little tree. Mm -hmm. I have some, of course, that are very valuable, but that doesn't matter. Oh, show him the false teeth. Oh, here is a pair that a man sent me, uppers and lowers. <laughs> <laughs> and here is a pair that I wore in David and Bathsheba which I've always kept, and these I wore in the movie I played opposite Tyrone Power. These were made for me by the patients of muscular dystrophy. I have many that are close to my heart, but I think the muscular dystrophy ones are the closest. You want to put those back? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Jane and Audrey Meadows, for letting us come and visit you this evening. Thank you, Ed. It, it's been very pleasant indeed. Thank you. Good night. Good night. In just a moment, we will be going up to New Rochelle to visit the creator of Howdy Doody, Bob Smith. Hi, friends. Well, it looks like the old hot weather is almost upon us. As a matter of fact, I had the point brought back to me very vividly the other day when a very young and very favorite nephew came rushing in and said, Hey, Uncle Bob, the geraniums are out. <laughs> you see, David calls all flowers geraniums. Well, he was right, which means that hot weather is just around the corner. And that also means that you'll be using your car more than ever. So I'd like to suggest that you don't put that spring changeover service off any longer. Put your car in your Amoco man's hands and be sure of pleasant, carefree driving all season long. Now, here is the sign to look for. 
Where you see this famous oval, you can be sure of expert lubrication. Differential and universal joints need attention now. Tie rods need greasing for summer. Your Amoco man knows where every lubrication point is on your car. He knows just the right grade of Amoco approved lubricants recommended by your car maker. Most important of all, be sure the winter oil is drained out. And that means that this famous double duty motor oil, new Permalube motor oil, the oil that cleans as it lubricates should be used by all means. Ask your Amoco man to drain out the old oil in your car's crankcase and refill it with fresh summer grade Permalube motor oil, the world's finest oil for hot and heavy summer driving. Now this is Bob Dixon reminding you again, don't put off that spring changeover service any longer. See your Amoco man first thing tomorrow morning. And now here's Ed Murrow. Two days after Christmas in 1947, a 27-inch piece of carved wood made its first appearance on television. It was called Howdy Doody. It was created by Bob Smith. And if there are any children around your house, uh, you will know what he has done with Howdy Doody. The children may not know the names of the presidents, but they know Howdy Doody and all his friends. Bob Smith is now referred to very often as Buffalo Bob. He had every intention of becoming a teacher of music, but as so often happens, he had to go to work at the age of 15. He worked in radio, a singer, musician, had his own children's show, and later did a children's show on radio. And finally, he gave birth to Howdy Doody. The program has been given the Peabody Award for the best children's program in television. Bob, his wife, Mildred, and their two sons live in this English Tudor house in New Rochelle, New York. It's a little less than an hour's drive to the NBC studios in town. Around the corner lives singer Jan Pierce and sports writer Frank Graham. A few blocks away lives Frankie Frisch, a member of baseball's Hall of Fame. This puts Bob in distinguished company because I gather his secret ambition in life has always been to be a ball player. Am I right, Bob? Yeah, you're right, Ed, and I've just been looking outside here, and uh, the weather doesn't look so good. I don't think we'll have Little League practice tomorrow. And do you get much chance to throw the ball around these days? Well, yeah, a matter of fact, you know, uh, my two boys, they play with a championship Pondridge Little League team up in the Bedford Hills League. Are, are the boys impressed with uh, what you do in television? Well, I don't think really, Ed. Uh, sometimes I think they'd... Oh, rather, I were a garbage collector, you know. <laughs> well, don't the kids ever try to trade on their father's name? Well, I think Mill would be a little better to answer that than I. I think she's sitting right here. Where's Buffalo Mill? Right here. Hey, there's Mill sitting with Happy Talk. Hi, Happy. Hello, <laughs> baby. Good evening, Mother Smith. Good evening, Ed. Tell me, is it true that uh, uh, the children never trade on their dad's name? Well, the best way I can tell you about that is Ronnie and Robin both went to a day camp a few years ago, and I went visiting, and I was watching the boys, and suddenly I saw about 30 children walking along, all carrying blankets and equipment, and at the head of the group was my Ronnie, with nothing in his hands at all, and I uh, spoke to him later about it, and I said, now, Ronnie, why should you get along without carrying anything, and this other little fellow have to carry all your equipment? And he said, well, I'm famous. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't think that's very nice to cash in on your father's name that way. He said, this had nothing to do with Daddy. He said, I hit three home runs today. <laughs> <laughs> how, how long have you and Bob been married? Thirteen and a half years. How, how did you two meet? We met in Buffalo in the first grade of public school 53. And we weren't very serious then, but I became suspicious when we were in fourth grade because he wrote in my autograph book, Dear Millie, roses are red, violets are blue, sugar, <laughs> garlic is strong, and I'm garlic for you. Oh. <laughs> Robert Schmidt. <laughs> is, is that authentic, Bob? It certainly is. I didn't know she kept that silly thing. <laughs> Bob, you, you work with kids every day. Uh, are the ones who come to see your show easy to handle? Uh, yeah, generally, Ed. This is a big day for them. <coughs> and, uh, well, once in a while we have a little problem, like... Uh, Oh, I remember the one day you were standing next to Doc Whipple, our organist, and during the old-time movie, 
That's the one time where no one on the crew works except uh, Doc Whipple, our organist, and I. I do the narrating, and Doc is playing the organ a mile a minute, you know. And uh, during the movie, all these cameramen and setup men were standing around doing nothing. I was telling about the movie, and a little boy walked over to me, and he said, uh, Buffalo Bob, he said, I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so I, yes, I, over there, you know, kept telling the movie, and I pointed over to one of our NBC pages, and he went over and didn't find anybody that looked uh, equipped, shall we say, <laughs> to take him, you know, so he saw Doc Whipple, and I guess he looked the fatherly type, so Doc was playing a fire engine scene, you know, and the little kid comes over and he says, Mr. Would you please take me to the bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> I finally took him. Yeah, you did, that's right. <laughs> Bob, do you, uh, do you bring Howdy home with you? From your work? Well, no, not usually, Ed, unless I'm doing a, uh, some kind of a personal appearance over the weekend. Oh, we have a form of howdy duty, though, downstairs in our playroom. Howdy and Mr. Buster and Clarabel and all our Dutyville gang. C could we see them? Well, sure. Come on, let's go downstairs. How about it, Happy? You want to come down? No, she has a little arthritis, Ed. She'll be all right in a week. <laughs> all right, Happy, you stay there. Taking a little tour here through the kitchen. Don't leave, Mother. This is the kitchen where you make Christmas cookies. <laughs> and let's see, what do we... Aha, uh -huh. there, there must be the ball players. Hey, here are the ball players. Uh, Mr. Murrow, this is Ronnie. How are you, Ronnie? Hello, Mr. Murrow. Ronnie is uh, 11 years old, and this is Robbie, who is 12. Well, I know you fellows like to play baseball. What positions do you play? Well, I play catcher, and I play first base. First base? Yeah. yeah. Do you stop them all, Ronnie? Well, yeah. What else do you do besides play baseball? Well, we go fishing lots of uh, times. What kind of fishing? Well, we go perch fishing and bass fishing in our lake. Trout, too? Yeah. Now, level with me. Do you fellows ever use worms, or do you use flies and plugs? Well, we use both. Right now, the perch are running, so we use worms, but in the summertime, we use lures uh -huh. and plugs. Uh, Bob, are you the kind of fisherman who always remembers the big one that got away? Oh, well, the biggest ones always get away. <laughs> but uh, uh, this winter, uh, Mill and I were happy enough to have hooked and landed seven bonefish. We did bring two of them back with us, and this is a... A uh, five-pound smallmouth bass that little Ronnie caught when he was just about eight years old on a three-and-a-half-ounce fly rod. Uh-huh. And, Ed, we were talking about our friends down here. Yes. Uh, I'd like to have you look at the, the drawing that Milt Neal, one of our artists, uh, made for us. These are the uh, Howdy Doody puppet characters all playing pool. Here's little Dilly Dally, who usually mops anyway, so he's playing pool, mopping his, uh, or rather, chalking up his mop, as you'll see. And over there is Clarabelle, who's knocking the balls into the pocket with a seltzer bottle. Yes. And then uh, Howdy making a three-ball combination. And then there's the princess over there. And next to the princess is the flub-a-dub juggling eight balls. And Mr. Bluster with his crooked cue. He's a little crooked by nature anyway, you see. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bob, uh, since you started out to be a music teacher, I suppose uh, you play a few instruments, don't you? Yeah, I played piano and organ professionally for quite a few years. Matter of fact, I still play organ in church on Sunday. Mm -hmm. You and also uh, teach a Sunday school class, don't you? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm superintendent of our Sunday mm -hmm. school class. Has, has any of this musical ability of yours rubbed off on Ronnie and Robin? Yeah, well, we all like to play, put it that way. And as a matter of fact, come on, let's, uh, let's take you into our studio. Now, this is... Uh, put the cues down, kids. This is the studio where I did my morning show on NBC for, oh, some five years. Uh, Ronnie, you show them the way there. And uh, in here, Ed, you'll notice I have uh, quite a collection of, of records that I'm very, very proud of. This was our control room, which is now a film editing room in the kids' chemistry laboratory. Mm -hmm. And, uh, oh, we got saxophones and trombones around, even the kids' Trumpet and clarinet. Ed, uh, do you think you could uh, sign up a good trio? Let's listen. Let's have an audition right now. Might even accompany the Meadow Sisters someday. What do you say? <laughs> How about it, kids? You all ready? Huh? All right, let's, let's beat something out for Ed. Come on, here we go. A one, a two. <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> oh, fine, fine. <laughs> don't, don't sign up without talking with me. <laughs> all right, Eddie, you'll be all right. <laughs> Bob, you've had a long run on television. Yeah, I guess we did, Eddie. Uh, how do you account for uh, such a long and successful series? Well, uh, pretty hard question to answer. I guess one of the big reasons is, of course, the fact that uh, we never did play down to the kids. I never wanted to be called Mr. Smith or even a big brother Bob, which I was at first. And we latched onto the name Buffalo Bob so that I could be down to the kids on their level and they could call me Buffalo Bob and square off me as if I were another kid. Well, you obviously don't find it difficult to play to children, but what about their parents? Well, once in a while we, uh, we get a letter from a parent who isn't too happy. Like, for instance, uh, one day about two years ago, I got a, uh, a letter that said, uh, Dear Buffalo Bob, uh, my son called you after your television show last night, and uh, we got a $16 phone bill this morning. <laughs> Come up with half of it. So I did. <laughs> Once in a while, a parent will say, you know, I have to sit through that show or watch with my kids, and I don't understand it. Well, actually, Ed, we have uh, really set out to entertain just kids. I mean, if a parent uh, agrees with that what we're doing is right for their own entertainment, then we have to change. We have the wrong format. We want to entertain strictly the kids. And very often a parent will say the show is silly. Well, sure, it's silly to an adult, but have you ever seen a two, three, four, five-year-old kid play? It's sort of silly to us, too, you know? Uh, Bob, the last time you went on vacation, you said something about going to look for a platinum platypus. Oh, yeah. Uh, wh what are you going to look for when you go on vacation this time? Well, I have found that uh, through the cathode ray and an antihistamine tube, which has recently been perfected, uh, it is now possible to have an electromindomizer which through this cathode tube projects into the brain and you can actually read a person's mind. Now, I'm out to get an electromindomizer the next time I want to take a vacation. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bob Smith. If you find one, either destroy it or get one for me too, will you? I promise it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bob Smith, for letting us come and visit you tonight. Very agreeable indeed. We'll be back in a moment. Hi, I have here two paper cylinders, one pure black, and the other gray. I wanted you to see them because they illustrate a very important difference in Amico gas. Now, the first chance you get, just rub your finger inside the end of your car's exhaust pipe, just the very tip end. You'll get a smudge that will either be pure black or any one of a number of lighter shades, like this gray. Now, any residue in the exhaust pipe, lighter than black, means that harmful metallic deposits are forming in the engine. Pure black, means no metallic deposit. Now, that illustrates a very important point visually of what we've been saying about Amoco gas. It's pure petroleum with nothing added that can form a metallic deposit. It's natural power, safe for engines. So make the exhaust pipe test. If you get a lighter than black answer, make your next tank full Amoco gas for full power without penalty. And now here's Ed Murrow. We have been visiting live tonight with Jane and Audrey Meadows. And then we went up to talk with Bob Smith, the creator of Howdy Doody and his family. There are some of the people who contributed to this program. From person to person, good night and good luck. Good evening, I'm Ed Murrow. The name of the program is Person to Person. And come to think of it, no other program can make that claim. Our informal visits, of course, are all live. There's no film. And with the help of this mechanical marvel called television, we'll be visiting first at the home of Steve Allen and his wife, Jane Meadows. And then on to Joliet, Illinois, where the warden of the state penitentiary, Joseph Reagan, and his family will be waiting for us, socially, that is. We'll be ready in exactly 20 seconds. Noxema, the most famous skin cream in America, the only leading beauty cream especially medicated for your skin. Medicated for a fresher, lovelier complexion. Teenage skin problems. Rough red hands. Noxema for skin comfort, skin beauty presents person to person. Steve Allen is that casual young man you can find on television five nights a week. 
For reasons that are rather apparent, his program is called Tonight. Steve is one of the most versatile men in the business. He's a comedian who can also play it serious. He's a performer who can also write well. He composes music, plays the piano, and on occasion has been known to wrestle with a crocodile. And in addition to all this, he's a very pleasant fellow indeed. Steve's parents were vaudeville troopers. And to continue the show business angle a bit further, Steve Allen is married to actress Jane Meadows, whom we visited last year when she was single and living with her sister, Audrey. Jane, Steve, and his son, David, live in this apartment house on Park Avenue here in New York City. It's about a 25-minute ride across town to Steve's television studio. Since he has to go to work very shortly himself, let's drop well, in on the Allens and lose no wolf. more time. Uh, tell me, what's in the basket? All the same old jazz, said Red. Baby, said the wolf, don't put it down. I have to, said Red. It's getting heavy. I'll handle the joke, said the wolf. Let's open the basket. I've got eyes. I'm hip, said Red. Not to mention the fact that you can say that again. Grandma, what frantic eyes you have. The better to dig you with, my dear, said the wolf. And Grandma said, Red, I don't want to sound rude, but what a long nose you have. Yeah, said the wolf, it's a gasser. And Grandma said, Red, your ears are the most, to say the least. What is this, snapped the wolf face inspection? I know my ears aren't the greatest, but what are you going to do? Let's just say somebody goofed. <laughs> well, there's more tomorrow. <laughs> Evening, Steve. <laughs> Hi, Ed. I didn't want to interrupt. Uh, how are you, David? Fine. Are you about ready to go to bed now? Yeah. That's a nice bathrobe you're wearing there. Thank you. Good. <laughs> Steve, that story you were reading, uh, it sounded familiar, but uh, somehow the words didn't. Well, it is a little peculiar, Ed. This is a, uh, a new book with a few distortions of the classic fairy tales that I've uh, put together called Bop Fable. Simon and Schuster bring them out in a few weeks, and I'm trying them on my son here. David, tell <laughs> me, do you like those stories? Yes. What do you like about them? Just good fun? Yeah. Tell me, uh, do you have any chance to go ice skating recently? Mm, yes. You like it? Yeah. Fall down? Yeah. Only once or twice, huh? Yep. Good. <laughs> Steve, uh, where's the prettier half of the Allen family? Well, as they say in the movies, here she comes now. Yeah? <laughs> Dave, you want to run along go to bed? You going to run to bed now, sweetheart? Ah. Will you kiss me before you Took go? A little nap oh, today. thank you. Mm. <gasps> and I've got lipstick all over you. Uh -oh. <laughs> Good night, <laughs> David. <laughs> Good, Good, me, Dave. <laughs> Good night, Dave. Good, Good evening, Ed. How are you? Uh, Jane, I don't think I've seen you since we dropped in on the Meadows Sisters on Person to Person sometime last spring. No, uh, that's right. Do you see much of Audrey these days? Oh, I see Audrey almost every day, Ed. And uh, if I don't see her, then we talk on the phone for a couple of hours and run up Steve's bill. <laughs> Tell me, uh, did Audrey ever get that apartment refurnished? Yes, as a matter of fact, it was furnished the Monday after you visited us. <laughs> it's very pretty. I wish you could see it. Uh, Tell me, were there any repercussions to that visit we made with all that gear? We had a very nice repercussion. If you remember, uh, Audrey and I sang Jesus Loves Me, This I Know in Chinese. Yes. And about, uh, oh, a couple of weeks after that, I did a telethon, and all night long people requested that I sing the song. Then, uh, about a month later, Audrey and I sang it on I've Got a Secret, and as a result, we're going to cut our record next week. Oh. First record we've ever made. Bravo. Good. Tell me, uh, Steve, uh, do, do you two ever think of working together, perhaps in a play or a movie? Yes, uh, I'd like to very much. The problem actually is time, but we'd like to do something together. We'd like to do a play. Yes. I suppose you might find time to write that play, Steve, since you don't have much to do. Oh, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> well, I've, I've got a few other things I'm trying to finish up first, Ed. Uh, so maybe I'll have to put the play at the end of the line. What, what have you been writing recently? Well, besides the Bop Fables that uh, we were talking about, uh, Henry Holt is bringing out a book of short stories I've just finished up. And I'm also writing a book about uh, the other comedians in the business, a book called The Funny Men. Tell me, uh, do you always work on a lot of things at once? Is this a habit? Or? He always does, Ed. <laughs> it's kind of a bad habit. I, I wouldn't advise anybody else to do it, but as long as I get things finished up, it makes me feel all right, and I, I work better if I'm doing 84 things at once. <laughs> uh, Steve, what, what do you say about funny men in this book that's upcoming? Well, uh, I like uh, humor. By that, I mean I, I like uh, to watch other comedians work. I'm, I'm a great audience. I, I like just about everybody in the business. Uh, I like to, to listen to them and, and uh, laugh at them, I should say. And I, in this book, tried to analyze what the heck I'm laughing at. It's about the size of it. It's oh. a very unusual idea. I've read parts of it, Ed. And it's very fascinating. Steve, you must get some other things off your chest, too, don't you, in that book? Uh, yes, I have a few uh, things I've wanted to say for a long time, just not to, you know, do four hours here about the book. Uh, one thing is that I, 
I try to refute the old belief that there's no such thing as a new joke. I think that's sort of a silly belief, but I hear people, sometimes even in the business, say those are, there are only seven basic jokes, you know? Uh -huh. I think there are millions of jokes. Well, Jane, you probably have some thoughts about comedians, uh, especially comedians Steve Allen. Um, do you have any special problems living with him? Problems, Ed? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Did I say the wrong thing? Oh, no. As a matter of fact, I only have one problem with Steve. It's our marriage. He's, uh, he's a little bit, Ed, he's a little bit absent-minded, and he has a habit occasionally of forgetting things. Mostly things like the car. He will drive the car to the theater and put it in the garage across the street and then come home in a taxi. But uh, <laughs> well, tonight I brought the car home in a taxi. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I tell about Valentine's Day last year? You wouldn't mind, would you? Well, tell it anyway. <laughs> May I? Yeah. Last year on Valentine's Day, Steve had forgotten about it until I turned up with my present for him. And he sat down and wrote me a poem. And it was the most beautiful poem I've ever read in my life. I still have it. <laughs> what, what did it say? Well, it's it was put away. Ah. <laughs> well, <laughs> Steve, right. fr from what I've seen so far, Jane's done a pretty good job of getting your place fixed up. She certainly has. Uh, I lived here under rather unusual circumstances. <laughs> I sort of slept on a hook in the closet and that sort of thing. It was, you know, sort of a bachelor's apartment. But Jane has done a wonderful job of uh, redecorating it. She's worked with Jim Gunn. Yes, you know, a young man who's helped me. Actually, my hobby is interior decorating. And um, Betty Furness lived here before Steve took the apartment, Ed. She uh -huh. moved out because the icebox didn't work anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but it, uh, one of the things that I like was putting the shutters up. They, there are lots of shutters in California, but most people in New York have curtains, and I decided it would be a little different if I used shutters. Uh -huh. And um, Should we show them around the place? I'd love to have you see the dining room. We're walking through the hall now, and this... This room is the dining room, Pardon my back. and it's also actually my very favorite room in the house. It's my favorite because it was two very small bedrooms, and Steve and I had a wall taken down in the middle of the room, and to make it look larger, we bought this wallpaper that is, um, uh, well, I looked at every piece of wallpaper in New York City before we picked it. It has a feeling of a perspective, at least in the room it does, and it makes it look longer and larger. Mm -hmm. That's where we stayed in Miami, right here, in that little room. <laughs> 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 Jay, tell me, when you, <laughs> when you were decorating, did you have many run-ins with the painters? Oh, yeah, she ran in with a new painter every 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the only thing is that I'm a frustrated painter, Ed. I like to paint walls and ceilings and floors and things like that. But we do have a painter in the family who paints pictures, and that's Steve. Well, it seems to me that everyone is going in for painting these days. And it's got to stop. I have a... Uh, and you're going to stop it, huh? <laughs> you stop me. I have a little painting in the hall of Steve's that I'd love to have you see. Good. It's this one right here. He's done quite a few, but this one is my favorite because somehow, I'll, well, I don't know, I think it's the simplest one you've ever done. It's that for sure, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe in trying everything, Ed, but uh, I tried painting and found out I had no talent. There's no sense fighting these things. No, know? this uh -huh. this has a very primitive, simple feeling, and I love it. <laughs> what What's the bust on the piano? Are you a sculptor too, Steve? Uh, no, that's something I've ever tried, Ed. Uh, this, however, is Jane. That's her right there. This is something that she had done when she was in Italy a couple of years ago. Done about eight years ago, I guess. About eight years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, by Farpi... Uh, Vignoli. Vignoli. Uh-huh. Very nice, too. Fine piece of work. Steve, is uh, that piano where you write your songs? Oh, I write a few here, steal a few, but I usually do the musical work. Uh, He's done a lot of things. Here is an album, Ed, that Steve has just brought out, Music for Tonight. It has about three of your numbers in it, doesn't it, dear? Can't tell if this is a program or an inventory, but anyway, here, <laughs> <laughs> here, here it is. This is an album that, as Jane says, we're bringing out in a couple of weeks. And uh, it may go back in after about two more. I don't know, but we're bringing it out. Uh, Jane, you once told me that Steve was the shy, bookish type. He, he doesn't strike me that way somehow. Oh, well, what I meant, Ed, when I said he was a shy, bookish type... I, I read guess shy I was... books. <laughs> <laughs> I was comparing him to the average performer. And um, I think that the average performer is a little more extroverted and maybe a little more aggressive than Steve. Actually, I think Steve is like you or my father and my brothers. He's a very serious man and a very thoughtful man. And I don't know whether you know it or not, but Steve was just elected the Outstanding Man of the Year by the Junior Chamber of Commerce of New York City. And to me, that's what he is. <laughs> so you've got him all figured out already? Well, I've been working on it for about two and a half years. <laughs> Uh, Steve, I know you have a rough schedule. Uh, what does this do to your home life? 
Well, it ruins it all together, Ed, to tell you the truth. I was very happy to be on this show because this is the nicest little visit I've had with Jane in six weeks. <laughs> now, to tell you the truth, it, it just seems worse than it is because uh, while my hours are peculiar, like I, I don't get to bed till three in the morning, I get up at noon, and I see Jane at peculiar times, but uh, if you add the hours up at the end of a 24-hour period, I suppose we spend as much time together as the average couple. Well, I don't see a lot of you on television, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever criticize him really severely? No, I don't criticize Steve. I, I have been trying to learn from Steve a great deal about comedy. And uh, I can't make a joke, Ed, but I do think that today I know when Steve is going to make a joke. I can sort of see a little twinkle in his eye. The, um, well, even I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to tell you that the day that we were married, when we were in the middle of a ceremony, uh, where, you know, Steve has to repeat, I, Steve Allen, take you, Jane Meadows. Yes. Steve had taught me that there is something in comedy. Do you call it, uh, what do you call it, dear? The well, extension or something, yeah, exaggeration? The extension of a commonplace action to an yes. absurd limit. Well, in the middle of the ceremony where Steve was saying, I, Steve Allen, take you, Jane Meadows, to be my lawfully wedded wife, all of a sudden, outdoors, a dog barked. And I thought, he isn't going to. And I looked up at him, and all of a sudden, I saw the little twinkle in his eye. And after the ceremony, I said, Steve, did you hear the dog bark? And he said, yes. And I had to pinch myself to keep from doing it. <laughs> no, I, I wasn't going to bark. Maybe growl a little bit. <laughs> uh, Steve, tell me this. Uh, can anybody learn to ad lib? I believe they can, Ed. As a matter of fact, everybody already knows how. It's, uh, it's something you do all day. You know, you go into a butcher shop, you don't think, now what one-liner will I lay on the butcher here to get some good pork chops? You just <laughs> order what you want. And I think the matter then is just to learn how to relax on the air the way you do in a butcher shop, and that's about it. Well, why can't I do it then? We have no butcher shop around here, <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> Well, I, I take it both of you are doing what you want to do, is that right? I am, are you? I sure am. <laughs> Well, there you are, both committed now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Steve <laughs> Allen and Jane Meadows. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. Thanks for letting us come and visit you. It's very pleasant indeed. Thank you, Ed. Good, Good night. night. Yeah. Good night. Good luck. In just a moment, we'll take you to the Illinois State Prison and a visit with Warden Joseph Reagan and his family.